In this last vodcast for Chapter 9, Covalent Bonding, we're going to take a look at electronegativity and how it can cause molecules to become polar. Then we'll have a look at how that impacts the strength of the covalent bonds that two atoms can have within a molecule. So the review here. Electronegativity is just a numerical system of ranking the hogginess that one atom has for another atom's molecule or electrons in a molecule. So basically it's a numerical number and whoever has the bigger number is keeping the electrons closer to its side of the molecule. It won't be sharing its electrons very evenly. If you'd like to do a review on that, it's back on pages 263 to 264. In our pictures in this podcast today, you will see red color indicating that this is a molecule that has an atom on one side or the other, in this particular case on the right, that is much more electronegative. So red colors are in symbolizing that this is where the electrons are more likely to be found at any moment in time. Remember we did this electronegativity chart and as we look at the trends on the periodic table you can see that as you go up the chart or I like to say go down it decreases but either direction hopefully you can see that the values of electronegativity get smaller towards the bottom or another way to say that, higher towards the top. But there's a definite trend as you march from left to right of atoms becoming more electronegative um, with some up and down, so the general trend works fine. Notice that we don't include the noble gases because they're not going to be doing any kind of sharing at all, so there's no way to really rank their ability to share their electrons. Now there are some compounds that do form uh, bonds in the, in the noble gases, but not too many. So our greatest, and that would be, let's take a quick look again, the perfect 4.0 on the periodic table. Right here you can see that that is where the 4.0 of fluorine is for the highest electronegativity, and the lowest kitty corner from that on the far left side of the periodic table, you can see that cesium is the lowest. So in general, metals have low electronegativity, Nonmetals are much higher and inert gases are not assigned because they don't create any kind of bond to begin with. Now I'd like to introduce you to the gentleman who created the chart. This is Linus Pauling. I think by now there probably have been people who have won more than one Nobel Prize, but he's in a very select group. Originally he won the Nobel Prize in Chemistry for creating the electronegativity chart. It came very close to beating Watson and Crick and understanding the structure of DNA he did give us the structure of the hemoglobin molecule that's in our bloodstream that carries oxygen. But along towards the late 50s, early 60s, Linus Pauling and a group of other scientists that were labeled peacenecks came up with the concept that this nuclear bomb that they had helped to create might not have been a, such a good idea after all. And for his work, Linus Pauling was also granted the Nobel Peace Prize. Now what we do is some simple math to determine the polarity of bonds within a molecule. You simply find the mathematical difference. Hmm, mathematical difference. I subtract, and all I gotta do is take the big number and take away the little number. So for example, here are two identical fluorine atoms bonded to each other. Fluorine's not polar. Why? because there is no difference in the way that they share their electrons. That's why it's this cool shade of green, no red in that diagram at all. So if I went to the electronegativity chart and I found the electronegativity of one atom, four, and the other, the same, four minus four is zero, they share the electrons evenly between them. It is a nonpolar covalent bond. We'll explain what the word polar means here in just a moment, but the attracting power that each fluorine atom has for the electrons is the same. Now, if you take a look at it using a kind of a valence structure or electron dot structure here, you can see that that pair in the center right here is shared equally between the chlorine atoms. They're an equal distance apart, not closer to one side or the other. Let's take a look at those diatomic molecules again. Remember these are the Brinkelhoff. I suppose astatine is also diatomic or two-atomed molecule, but because it's radioactive it's often not mentioned. All of these elements that exist as diatomic molecules are nonpolar. 
They don't have any parts on them where there are slight charges because they share their electrons evenly between them. Do noble gases form diatomic molecules? I think you know the answer to that. Absolutely not. They're already stable and do not need to bond to any other atom to get a stable octet. Now, I've been talking about being polar and not polar. Well, let's look at what a polar covalent bond can create. Now, when hydrogen is bonded to fluorine, there's a bigger difference in the electronegativity. In fact, if you go to the chart, you would see that the electron, um, electronegativity of fluorine, of course, is 4, and that of hydrogen is only 2.1. This time, over here in the zone of where the red is, this is the zone where we have greater electron density. And since electrons carry a negative charge with them, if you could freeze time and take a snapshot of that little molecule there at any moment in time, you're going to find most of the molecules over on the side where the fluorine is. And since they carry a negative charge, that makes that side kind of negative. And the universe always has a yin for a yang. If one side's kind of negative where the fluorine is, on the side where the hydrogen in is, it's kind of positive. And we have created a dipole. So the fluorine end is kind of negative, or partial negative we call it, and the hydrogen side of the molecule is partially positive. These two symbols that you can see here stand for partial. That means kind of positive. Not a plus one and a minus one, not a whole number integer of a charge, but a, a partial kind of charge. Now another name for these polar bonds or molecules is a dipole. And a dipole is, can be symbolized using those partial positive or negative signs. Or here is another way. You draw an arrow next to the molecule. The head of the arrow points to the side that's more electronegative and therefore has more electrons by it more often. And you put a little plus sign kind of built into the base of that bond showing that there's electron deficiency or more positive over by the hydrogen end. Now, uh, finding out if a molecule is polar or not is dead simple. Simply find the mathematical difference between the two bondings electron, bonding atoms' electronegativities. Now, the problem I have with this chart is that it's really shades of gray. And many charts say that if the difference goes from 0 to 0.3, we're going to call that nonpolar. And then 0.4 up to about 1.7, polar covalent bond. They're both sharing, but the polar one is sharing unevenly. Any electronegativity difference beyond 1.7 will consider to be ionic, not sharing at all. Now, I would never give you a combination that lands right on the border, like 0.4, but if I was to copy this chart into my notes, which I recommend, maybe go 0 to 0 0.3, 0 0.4 to 1.7, anything higher is ionic. If you were to look at sketches now showing the differences between the three, we've considered the first two already. I have some problem with the picture on the far right. Lithium is a metal. Fluorine is a nonmetal. Metal, nonmetal, ionic. So I wouldn't say that lithium fluoride is almost ionic. I would say it is ionic. And in fact, it's really in a crystal, not a separate molecule, of endlessly repeating lithium and fluoride ions organized in a lattice structure. So if the electronegativity difference is large, you're looking at the picture in the middle, a polar covalent bond and possibly molecule. And over on the far right, if the electronegativity difference is so great, they're not sharing anymore. Somebody, in this case the fluorine, rips away the one valence electron from the lithium. You have positive one and minus one ions, not a partial charge, a whole integer charge, and now you have electrostatic forces of attraction that pull those two ions together in an ionic bond. Now here's the last part of this uh, particular vodcast which is sort of interesting. It's possible for a molecule to have polar bonds but act as if it's nonpolar overall. And this is determined by how balanced or symmetrical the molecule is. So of the molecular geometry that we've learned, the seven shapes, can have an impact on the polarity overall. 
For example, water has an angular or bent geometry. As you can see, we've got bond dipoles here and here. Those are showing, according to the picture on the far right, that the electrons are more concentrated near the oxygen because it is more electronegative. Now see that third dipole down at the bottom? What we're saying is that's the overall polarity of the molecule. Each bond is polar and overall, yes, you would find a partial negative charge over by the oxygen zone and a kind of positives over by the hydrogens. So this is both having positive, excuse me, having uh, bond dipoles as well as the entire molecule is polar overall. So remember, where the electron density is being concentrated, that's where the overall polarity can be determined. Sometimes you'll see that referred to as an overall dipole moment, and because it's asymmetrical, bent, and it's got a unshared, two pairs of unshared electrons of the oxygen. It has both a polar bond as well as an overall dipole moment, meaning that it's a polar molecule. Now let's look at an example of what symmetry does. Here again are two atoms bonded to one in the center, but this time carbon, as you can see, does not have any unshared electron pairs on the center atom. Therefore, it remains a, um, a linear molecule. If I was to do the math and compare electronegativity of carbon to oxygen, I would find that this bond, in fact, is a polar bond, and the same for the one pointing from left to right. But since they both emanate from the center carbon out and opposite from each other, it's, it's as if they cancel each other out. And overall, the molecule acts as if it is nonpolar. That's why it says overall dipole moment is zero. So each bond can have its own polar bond or not, but since they cancel each other, it makes it a nonpolar molecule. And a very important factor about solutions is that polar substances like to dissolve in other polar substances. Nonpolar substances like carbon dioxide do not like to dissolve in polar molecules like water. And anytime you've opened a soda and forgot about it and left it sitting on the counter and the soda goes flat over time, that's because the nonpolar CO2 bubbles that tickle your nose, they're out of there. They no longer want to stay in the polar water solvent. The only reason that pops and fizzes when you open up the can top is because it was put in there under pressure and sealed. You let the pressure off, they're gone. Now here are some more examples showing how the molecular geometry can impact polarity. Focus on the carbon tetrachloride in the center. This time we have four atoms, but it's very symmetrical that are attached to the carbon atom in the center. And all of the bond dipoles are out projecting outward from the center canceling each other out. So while each bond is polar, the whole molecule is not. Compare and contrast that to the, non, to the polar molecule of methyl chloride down in the bottom right. This time, here's the difference. Symmetry means that you have a balance to you, or that you have four atoms that are hooked to one. Whoopsies. Four atoms that are hooked to one in the center here. But these four atoms that are hooked to my carbon are not identical. There's one highly polar, highly electronegative chlorine molecule that's drawing the electron density towards the top. And notice that it's not being counteracted by any other bond dipoles that point in the opposite direction. A nonpolar trigonal planar boron trifluoride is in the bottom left corner. Pretty obvious there how the symmetry can work. The hydrogen chloride in the upper left corner is just two atoms hooked to one, or two atoms hooked to each other. So while it's linear, it is also polar. And there's no bond dipole that can cancel it out. And finally, in the upper right, where you can see the NH3, these three bond dipoles are all pointing towards the more electronegative nitrogen and are not canceling each other out. So it has both polar bonds 
and an overall polar molecule. This is a stopping point then. At this point in time, please check back onto Moodle and you will find a short quiz that will ask questions about this most recent podcast. Until then, see you next time.